Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth Harvard Radcliffe Institute book talk of the summer of 2022, um, which I think promises a very exciting uh, summer afternoon. Um, our uh, writer today is Olivia Lang, a genre bending uh, novelist, opinion journalist, flaneuse, and especially an essayist known for their sinuous, organic seeming, but highly crafted mastery of that form. Uh, the book on offering this afternoon is Lang's sixth, Everybody Out Today in the United States in paperback. Everybody is about freedom and repression, about ecstasy and pain, about organ accumulators and prisons, all running through the site of the never yet liberated human body. The book joins a wave of cur current criticism coming from many directions, interrogating the promise of sexual revolution and its discontent. Lang draws together the work of an improbable cast of thinkers and writers on liberation, from William Reich to Andrea Dworkin, whose papers our Schlesinger Library holds, from Malcolm X and Nina Simone to Kate Bush and Susan Sontag. These essays are as hard to describe as the free body itself. And so I'm ex especially excited to hear Lang read from and talk about their book. Lang's interlocutor will be another polymathic humanist feminist intellectual, Joey Soloway. As a transparent superfan, who is counting the days till the musical, which they first workshopped at Radcliffe in the summer of 2019, shortly before the pandemic, finally and at long last debuts in Los Angeles next March. It's sometimes hard for me to remember all the other things that Soloway has created, including the feature length film Afternoon Delight, the comic television series I Love Dick, and with their sibling Faith, the live action TV acid trip, The Real Live Brady Bunch. Soloway is also an author of a novella and two memoirs, the most recent of which She Wants It, Desire, Power, and The Toppling of the Patriarchy came out in 2018. The Schlesinger Library is proud to house the papers of the Soloway family, which includes scripts, drafts, production records, and other materials as well as uh, archives documenting the life and work of their mother, Elaine Soloway. I know I speak for everyone on the webinar when I say what an honor and a highly theorized pleasure it will be to learn from you both this afternoon. And with that, I will turn the virtual floor over to Olivia Lang. Hey, I'm... Oh, I'm so happy to be here. It's very nice to be in conversation with Joey, of whom I am a great admirer. There's a kind of um, unwritten rule that when you read from books, you're not supposed to read the end, but I feel like reading the end. I feel like that's where I want to begin today. Um, so I'm gonna do it. Say you wanted a better world. Say you fought for it and say that it unraveled that people were irrevocably damaged, that there were deaths. Say that the dream was freedom. Say that you dreamt of a world in which people were not hobbled or hated or killed because of the kind of body they inhabited. Say that you thought the body could be a source of power or delight. Say that you imagined a future that did not involve harm. Say that you failed. Say that you failed to bring that future into being. From feminism to gay liberation to the civil rights movement, the struggles of the last century were at heart about the right to be free of oppression based on the kind of body you inhabited. Able to live where you pleased, work where you pleased, eat where you pleased, walk where you pleased without the risk of violence or death. Able to have an abortion, kiss in public, engage in consensual sex without the threat of a prison sentence. The victories that did arise were hard won but they weren't permanently secured and already they're vanishing away. Perhaps Freud was right. Perhaps there is something atavistic in humans, 
an irrepressible will to violence, an instinctive desire to generate notions of us and them, to enforce borders between good and bad bodies, and to obsess over purity, degeneration, miscegenation and pollution. And yet, the dream of the free body doesn't go away. It buzzes in the air. It smells of honey. While I was writing these pages, I went to dinner with a friend who works as a teacher in Hong Kong. He described the protest that took place at the end of 2019, and he said that some of his students were facing prison sentences just for carrying a mask, for walking down the wrong street. Many things had been banned, including the word protest. So when they communicated with each other, the students used the word dreaming instead. I know that dreaming is dangerous, one of them told my friend, but dreaming gives me hope. Reich's dream, Dworkin's dream, Nina's dream, none of these better worlds have yet transpired. There is no republic of unencumbered bodies, free to migrate between states, unharried by any hierarchy of form. It's impossible to know if it will ever be achieved, but if I'm certain about anything at all, it's that freedom is a shared endeavor, a collaboration built by many hands over many centuries of time, a labor which every single living person can choose to hinder or advance. It is possible to remake the world. What you can't do is assume that any change is permanent. Everything can be undone and every victory must be refought. When I listen, as I often do, to 22nd century, I feel fear move through my body like a contaminating fog. If I look into the future, I too see ashes. I'm afraid every day of what lies ahead, especially the cruelties that will inevitably occur as resources diminish. There is so little time left already. The soil is poisoned, the glaciers melting, the oceans full of plastic. Already a new plague has exposed the drastic inequalities and in how our lives are valued and protected. Every day as I've sat down to write, there have been more stories about bodily harm on account of bodily difference. Precarious bodies. Bodies as a brutalized, limitless resource. I'm devastated by what is happening and by how difficult it, it being capitalism is to change. It's not the world I want in which difference is cherished, not a planet like a prison, but a planet like a forest. Violence is a fact. And yet, whenever I've sat in Joe's pub watching Viv or listened to Nina Simone sing, I felt the room expand around me. This is what one body can do for another. Manifest a freedom that is shared, that slips under the skin. Freedom doesn't mean being unburdened by the past. It means continuing into the future, dreaming all the time. A free body need not be whole or undamaged or unaugmented. It is always changing, changing, changing. A fluid form after all. Imagine for a minute what it'd be like to inhabit a body without fear, without the need for fear. Just imagine what we could do. Just imagine the world that we could build. I am very happy now to invite Joey Soloway to come and chat. Wow, I am so moved. That is that. That was so beautiful. Everything that you say is is feels like exactly what I need to hear right now, and that's the way I felt when I picked up your book a year ago. And I'm so excited that it's out in paperback. Mostly because when I buy it for everybody, it will cost me a little bit less. But um, I think I probably bought like 50 of them. And I was like, everybody, like, just let's all get caught up. For me, it was about how you wrote this beautiful story about the way fascism needs a binary. Mm -hmm. And I repeat that to people when I'm trying to kind of get people caught up. Look, fascism needs a binary. Tell me about how you came to that conclusion. I think by hanging out and looking a lot at Weimar Berlin, looking at what was happening in Germany in the 1930s and realizing that these things come in waves. And what happens when those fascist moments come is that genders are returned to their preordained roles. So men have to behave like men, women have to behave like women, sexual liberation goes out the window, abortion is very limited, apart from for certain kinds of body, in which case it's very much driven. 
um, homosexuality immediate climate down. So you just see these sort of patterns recurring. And I think I just wanted to understand why does this happen? What is this terror of the free body? Why do people get so excised, so um, uncontrollably distressed by other people's freedom? Why does it disturb them so much? And I think that is the sort of driving question of the whole work. Yeah, and I think that's the driving question of the world right now. Um, I, I see a few people are asking some questions. This is super exciting. So many people are interested in this, and I just want to let people know that as you start to have questions that you want to ask Olivia, just go ahead and put them in the chat. I'll be able to see them and try to synthesize them into this conversation. And I guess for me as an artist, I just feel like, well, shoot, it's real simple. I need to find a way to make it beautiful, readable, interesting, entertaining to kind of teach or at least crack open people's understanding. Um, tell me about the relationship that you see between white supremacy and patriarchy and how, how they operate around the idea of the binary with each other. We understand how they each are a binary, but when combined, what happens? Yeah, I think that they are this absolute twin force. And I think what I really wanted to do was, so I started writing this book, you know, around the time of Brexit, the rise of Trump, the refugee crisis, and you could see those two things happening together, that there was this sense that those figures were talking about refugees in terms that I hadn't had in my lifetime, language like cockroaches was being used, that sort of very demonizing, very visceral body horror language. And at the same time, they also have these sexual politics that are limiting women's freedom, that are limiting trans people's freedom, that are limiting homosexuality. So I think all of those things, all of those ideas around the disorderly body are like a sort of projection of chaos out of the white man's body onto everybody else's body, a displacing. And then the nightmarish thing about things like feminism is that it then continues to displace. So it displaces those anxieties back onto the trans person. Mm. You keep seeing people trying to displace, keep trying to displace. And it's that work that I feel like the resistance has to happen at that level. It has to happen at that level of why are we afraid of bodies? Why are we afraid of unruliness? Why are we afraid of fluidity? Why is fluidity such a terrifying thing? Why is unboundedness such a terrifying thing? This need to sort of clamp down and control bodies and make bodies disciplined, the fascist fantasy of the disciplined body, the body that moves in a block, as opposed to the disorderly body that is going to act in different ways. Oh, hey, there's an animal behind you. <laughs> there's a disorderly body behind you, Joey. Well then, and there's also a disorderly, gigantic thunderstorm in Provincetown. <laughs> kind of this is perfect conditions. Coming down me. hard. Yes, the disorderly weather. <laughs> well, um, okay, so this disorderliness that gets projected, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about lately, which is a completely different idea, and I want to hear your take on it, is that kind of Sylvia Federici. If, ma, if women aren't producing soldiers and aren't producing workers, that's the terror. Mm, yeah. You know, I, I kind of understand this idea. Joy Layden, a trans philosopher, was like, if there's a hundred people in, a, in, in the yard and there's a thunderstorm and they all have to go inside the school, saying boys here, girls here is actually the quickest way to get something done. So I understand the need for a quick, let's divide this group into two. But the kind of the kind of monstrous feeling that it that kind of creates that gets projected, do you think it has to do with the demand that that women belong to men, or is it really is it more spiritual? Is about just like mono, polytheism? I think that there is. I mean, it's interesting. You know, as I was reading that section, I was like, I wrote this before the repeal of Roe versus Wade, like when I'm saying we're losing the freedoms, actually a substantial freedom had not yet been lost. Yeah. So that sense of like, I'm interested in a very non-abstract way. Oh God, in what, major thunder out there. Major. In what, in what is driving that sense of, is it just basic misogyny? Is it a hatred of women? Is it a desire to control women? Is it some base idea that women belong to men? But also, the reinforcing of there are women and there are men, it comes up inevitably in any conversation you have with a right-wing person, even if you're just chatting, at some point, you know, they're gonna drop some bomb about trans people. And what they're gonna say is, 
it's biologically a fact it's biologically true that there are women and men and like if it's biologically true why do you need to spend so much energy changing people from how they actually want to behave to how you believe they should behave aren't you the one that's trying to make things work biologically? that's a good I'm answer pretty biologically as i am so that sort of sense i I feel like it's driven by some kind of terror. I feel like the terror is deeper than just a hatred of women. I think it's a hatred of a free body. I think that is a root cause of that kind of drive to police people. Yeah, and and fascism needs people to line up and the lines don't look straight if there are more than two yeah, you categories. Want two lines. You want to have your two lines and you want to have your good line and your left the line. You want to yeah. create this hierarchy. The other. Yeah. Well, I really, when I was reading the book, and I hope you guys can still hear me, this this <laughs> the craziest thunderstorm out here. But if you guys are in Boston, you probably see it. I loved feeling like you were right there at the Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft with anti-magnesia um, that they called Magnus Hirschfeld and you know, I think we, many of us have heard a lot about it, seen a lot about it. We tried to recreate it on Transparent. The, the journey to Berlin is also included in the musical that Faith is working on. What do you think a lot of people misunderstand about what it was like then at the Institute? You know, I, I hear that like, well, Margaret Sanger was there and, and they were all chatting and having talks. Like bring us into the mood and the feeling and what people were really emotionally all about at that time. I mean, I think there's amazingly liberating things going on in that moment. I think he's doing really interesting things in terms of people who would otherwise be in prison are allowed to live in the Institute. So that's interesting in itself. There are sex changes going on. Very early transsexuals are living there. But at the same time, when you say Margaret Sanger and Hirschfeld himself, one of the things that I found most stunning to discover was that they were all kind of subscribing to eugenics. They had eugenicist ideas. So... They believe in birth control, but at the same time, they're like, who should be allowed to reproduce? Should the poor be allowed to reproduce? Which kinds of poor should be allowed to reproduce? So it's like, it's the same thing as with feminism. You're not gonna get sexual liberationists who are utterly right on. There's always some level on which they're like, hey, liberty for these people, hmm, those people, maybe not so much liberty for them, don't really like how they look. You get that feeling of like, it's, it's a hierarchy of bodies. And, you know, I love Hirschfeld, you love Hirschfeld, but to find even he had a sense that there were fit bodies and unfit bodies was really sad, was really disturbing. And then you compare it to what happens, which is, you know, this is Weimar Berlin, this is sort of real moment of liberty and excitement and exchange of ideas, lots of sex. In come the Nazis, immediately the sexual liberationists are like the first target. The Institute itself is a target. So, you know, the marching boys in their immaculate uniforms, they're actually wearing shorts, which is kind of pretty kinky in itself. They come in, they're tearing up the papers, they're smashing things up. And that is where you see, like, this is the actual eugenicists. These are the people who are burning a figurine of Hirschfeld, they're burning all of his papers, they're burning photographs of trans people as a sort of prelude to what they're going to carry on doing. So I think it's this sort of sliding scale, it's like everybody contains some terror of otherness, but there are extremes, there's the fascist extreme and then there's the kind of something that's embedded in people that we can disentangle, I think, we can argue, we can talk about it, we can show people that they can enlarge their sense of what's allowable. And I'm gonna, I muted myself because of the lightning. <laughs> the moment you said the word Nazi, the whole sky here lit up. So whatever magic you're doing as a witch to change the change the discourse, the, the gods can hear you. As I, I feel like the things you're saying are, to me, they're the seeds. I mean, I, I think I told you that I had really been very depressed uh, throughout the pandemic, just trying to figure out what mattered now and it was reading everybody and thinking about the role of the artist as someone who needed to really put their body you know where their ideas were and be willing to to split that patriarchy you know split that split that you know um that sense of the binary with their every move but let me whip you through time and space to mar-a-lago last night where <laughs> the fbi <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Trump. 
Wow. <laughs> I will never forget this Zoom. <laughs> um, I'm going to go on mute so this doesn't disturb. But, I, you know, I, I have this theory about somebody like Trump who is able to kind of get people excited <clears throat> about being a kind, he's kind of an open monster. He's openly saying these monstrous things like, what in the world happened to me? And what is it about a monstrous leader that people love so much? No, that's a really I good question. Losing I'll, I'll answer that and hope that Jerry returns. I think the I think the monster thing is really fascinating. I think we've had a sort of lesser but on a similar scale uh, monster in Boris Johnson, and it's that sense of it's somebody acting out of the id. It's somebody who's just showing you all of those sort of dirty, grim things that you I say you somebody might feel that they desire. So I always think it's really interesting when people on the left are like they did this bad thing as if that's going to undo them. And it doesn't because the bad thing here, it was that having the parties all the way through COVID and smuggling alcohol in and in America, you know, you've got your own, but an awful lot of that audience is like, great, good on you. You don't pay taxes, good on you, that's fantastic. So that sense of somebody acting out of their worst impulses, I think can be exciting to people. That's that's the allure and that's the thing that needs to be targeted rather than sort of trying to shame them and say, what appalling behavior, I'm going to expose your appalling behavior, then everyone will see the truth and then they won't like you anymore. It never works like that. It is just so desirable. Now, have we lost Joey in a thunderstorm? <laughs> We may have Olivia. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna jump in in anticipation. Well, we, have of, we have audience questions here, so we could. Have yeah. No. And 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 I had a I had a few as well that I want to ask that are that are much more pedestrian kinds of process questions. So, tell us about how you chose this cast of characters. Um, uh, what inspired you? what sort of lifted you up, what disappointed you in the ways that you've already, um, excuse the dog's tail, have, uh, have suggested about um, uh, some of the Weimar heroes who also showed their very human and, uh, and embedded in time qualities. So um, it's, a, it's a dazzling array of folks. How'd you pick them? Uh, I'm, I'm loving the whole of these animals appearing in the background. Uh, so I always start books with a sort of a sense of the arc of the book and a sense of potential characters and then some of them ghost out some of them don't work out and some people's kind of step in and become more prominent so I knew with this one that Wilhelm Reich, the the um Austrian psychoanalyst sexual liberationist uh complete crank, all sorts of different things. I knew he was going to play a role, but I had no idea he was going to play such a central role. I had a sense that um, Andrew Dworkin might be in it. I had a sense that Malcolm X would be in it. I had no sense, for example, that Bayard Rustin was going to be in it. So what I'm doing then, once I start actually researching, is that I need people who cross paths with each other, just on a very technical level. I need to have some sense that they're coherently engaged in each other's lives and ideas so Susan Sontag for example worked very well for me as a character because she was very engaged in Reich she knew a lot about Reich's work she wrote illness as metaphor in response to Reich and um, James Baldwin also comes in because he was engaged with Reich's work Bayard Rustin I wanted to write about prisons and I just casually was looking at the prison that Reich had been in who else was in that prison a load of mafia dons had been in that prison and then I suddenly came across this civil rights activist who to my shame I hadn't heard of. And I looked into him and suddenly there's this character who is both gay and a civil rights activist and spent a lot of his life in prison, but also used the institution of prison as a weapon in his activism. I mean, you can't say no to that stuff. That's the joy of the research process because those things emerge from it. So in part, a cast comes at the very beginning of the book and in part, it really is something that comes out of research. So um, I want to I want to ask you to tack back to Reich for a minute. So um, he is a queer character in every sense. There's kind of a Reich uh, revival is too strong, but a um, 
uh, a rehabilitation of somebody who had been written off as a kind of kook. Um, locate yourself and everybody a bit with respect to the reputation of Reich. Um, does he deserve to be rehabil rehabilitated in part? How much? Why? <laughs> um, well, one of the things that I'm kind of low key doing with this book is I wanted to have complicated characters. I wanted to have people that had aspects of their life and aspects of their work that were intensely admirable and also things that were discardable. I wanted to show how people engaged in the struggle for freedom were damaged by that struggle in ways that are unpleasant because I feel like we're in a moment that's obsessed with purity. We want people to be absolutely perfect and if they put a foot wrong, we won't look at their work anymore. I am utterly in every fiber of my being opposed to that. So I really wanted to introduce this idea that here is a person who has ideas are beyond the pale really. I don't agree with his pseudoscience, I don't agree with his ideas about health, but I am fascinated by his ideas about abortion, his ideas about sexual liberation. What I think, and um, the thing I think that is most interesting about him, and the reason I think Andrew Dworkin of all people loved him, is that he was the one sexual liberationist who was really interested in sexual violence to women. He was really opposed to that, he was really opposed to rape, and the reason that he was is because he grew up in a violent marriage. His father discovered his wife had, Reich's mother had been adulterous and subjected her to violent beatings until she killed herself. And I think that fact, that painful, brutal fact is behind all of Reich's sexual liberation work, that that is what makes him understand the stakes of women. He understands what women are up against. If they're wanting to explore their sexual lives, that is what lies at the end. That is the punishment that he wants to take away. And I think that sense of really high stakes work makes him different from other sexual liberationists. And that's why it's such a shame that he's sort of, in some way preserved in history as the orgasm guy, you know, that he's there, people like Norman Mailer, he's got terrible fans, people like Norman Mailer who are like, it's all about your dick. And it, I don't think that's what Wright's work is about at all. I think it's much, much subtler and much more radical. So in some ways, I guess I'm coming in to lift him away from his fans almost as much as to rehabilitate him. And the parts of his work that I don't think are right, I think are interesting. I think they tell us something interesting about the times he lived in. I think they tell us a lot about 1950s America, that sense of Red Scare, that sense of paranoia. And the fact that somebody who believed at base that women's sexual lives should be free was punished so drastically by the American state. He remains the only person whose books were burnt on American soil by the American government. And those books include The Sexual Revolution and The Mass Psychology of Fascism. And those were the books that were chosen. So it seems to me even the worst of his life has an awful lot to tell us about our historical, political, and social state. I guess that's what really drew me to him. I, I um, that's that's wonderful and really captures the subtlety of what you're doing in the book. I wanted to ask you to go back to your comments about the moral perfectionism of our moment. So. Um, on the one hand, there is a utopian impulse to everybody. Um, on the other hand, you're you're wary of that um, uh, of that kind of moral perfectionism. So, speak a bit about um, about our own moment in moral discourse, if you would. And uh, when um, when you and Joey were talking, uh, you you gave us a little hint of dissatisfaction with feminism um, or its limitations and awareness of the limitations of feminism. And I'd love to press you a bit on that too, Olivia. Yeah, sure. I think, um, you know, there's, there's lots of ways in which I think the idea of cancel culture used by the right to shut down the left, but at the same time, there is some truth to it. There is some sense that there's a sort of um, atmosphere of, dredging through people's history to see if they ever took a position that was wrong. And I think it is much healthier to assume that all of us took a position that were wrong. All of us were born in a state of ignorance and we enlarge as we move through life. And the idea that it's sort of fatal to somebody's ongoing 
life artistic practice engagement to have made a mistake or to have not known enough seems to me very frightening. It seems to me not a very safe place to start having the kind of conversations that we need to have, which are painful, hard conversations. So that troubles me. And that was something that I, you know, maybe don't talk about specifically in everybody, but it's very much in the impetus of how it's built and how it's structured to sort of show that these characters, Andrew Dworkin is another example, Sontag sort of an example, Nina Simone very much an example, Nina Simone was violent to her own daughter, to sort of see how these people can have enormous ideals, a huge amount of insight, and at the same time, not be able to pass undamaged through the systems that they're trying to change, by which I'm talking mostly about white supremacy and patriarchy, that they can be damaged by those systems, that they can behave in ways that are appalling, and yet still, have illuminating ideas to be able to sort of contain both and to not split not try and put people into good and evil categories but to hold that sort of fluidity and that kind of dangerous ambiguity feels to me like work that we all really need to be engaged in at the moment and and what does that work do for our own posture for your posture as a critic um and as a builder of a future so um i think there's a there's a humility and generosity in what you've described as a, I'm a historian and I'm particular in, particularly interested to in that, um, in that posture towards the past and what it gives us as we speak to the future. And then I think we have Joey on the phone. Joey, are you there? And I can, um, I can throw the mic back to you. Can you hear me right now? We hey, can hear you. Hey. Oh, okay, great. I'm a, I'm just a voice, I think, for now. That is fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, Jane, I was loving what you were saying, and I'm, I'm, I'm so, um, I was so excited to, just to listen as well. I mean, in some ways, I feel like you're talking about a particular kind of a key of sort of the obvious that you're hoping that people will understand. And in, in some ways it almost seems too obvious what you're saying. Do you relate to that? I mean, it seems that pretty bodies obvious. Are not, that, bodies are, that bodies aren't bodies. Or what is it, what, tell me how everybody, this title works so beautifully. How, how yeah. does it, how does it help us think about what to do with our bodies as we're attempting to live in this moment where fascism is, is unthinkably further along than we ever could have imagined, ever could have imagined. You know, some people just think if you're a radical, if you're an activist, if you're an other, if you're marginalized, like focus on, on pleasure for your body and um, start there. I think the danger Thoughts? in this moment is that we start to do fascism's work for it, that we start to police ourselves that we start to limit the kind of things that we're going to do preemptively because we're afraid of what's going to happen. I, do, I talk and write a lot at the moment about my concern with why we all keep producing dystopias because I feel like we're almost, we're doing their work for them. We keep giving them great ideas of how to organize these societies in which we're oppressed. And I'm not blaming all of this on Margaret Atwood. And, and, and say, what, what do you mean by that exactly? What do you mean, I mean exactly by that, by how we're doing our work, for, their work for them? We, we are imagining the wrong things. We're imagining futures in which we are destroyed. And I think we need to be imagining futures in which we are emancipated. I think we need to be imagining futures in which we figure out in great detail the organization of better worlds in which many people of many different natures can live together. And huge amounts of imagination in film and TV and novels goes into imagining bad scenarios, imagining future horrors, imagining climate change apocalypse, imagining far right anti-women worlds. And I feel like it's really interesting how, I can see why it's happening, but it's really interesting that it's very hard to name a bunch of utopian movies, TV series and films that where we might have figure out some of these questions of how we organize our bodies, how we live together. Well, I mean, I, I can report straight from the front lines, you know, in <laughs> Hollywood of, of what's selling right now. And, and people are saying uh, all the streamers are asking for stuff that, that drifts more to the right and has a very clear villain. And, and, and there's, there's a distinct lack of interest in subtlety. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that doesn't surprise it's sort me. Of, it's like a, a, po a post-transparent world. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. And maybe that was a sort of peak of a moment where people could envisage. I didn't think it was a peak. I thought it was the beginning of like... Me too! Oh, I, <laughs> that's, that's two of us. <laughs> I thought we were on the way, but maybe that's just... Let's call it a plateau and assume that we're going to get higher next time. But yeah, I mean, I think transparency stands out in that way because it did feel like it was envisaging ways in which people could live together with difference, that thing that everybody seems to find so impossible. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't know. I, to me, there's this, this kind of idea, this non-binary, for me, going on my non-binary journey has kind of opened up the world not only to a third space that holds the binary, but the third space that is really a whole other part it's the you know the paper underneath the argument it's the context within which the argument happens it's the you know the third to me when I look at something like we've been going our whole lives believing that you know when something is something is wrong you know fight or flight fight or flight hey fight or flight like there's a binary and we accept it and then when I look further into binaries and go oh I, I've heard people saying freeze I've heard people saying fight flight freeze I've heard people saying fight, flight, freeze, fawn, fuck, infinity. You know, they don't all have to start with F. But once you break <laughs> up the binary, <laughs> you know, I'm not being paid by the F council in case you're curious. But once you break the binary open, there's else that starts to have its own own presence, its own mass, the, 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 uh, everything around the binary. Yeah, I think there's I think there's loads of truth in that. And I think that's probably that state, that moment is probably also what I'm calling freedom in the book. That's probably what Nina Simone is hitting when she's, you know, playing a concert, it's frustrating, it's frustrating. And then suddenly there's a moment where it goes beyond that. Everybody in the room feels it's gone beyond that. It's gone beyond the sense that people are trapped in their own bodily identities and it gets to something larger than that. And I think that that's probably, we're using different language, but we're probably talking about the same thing. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a theorist in LA, Stacey Smith. She calls it an ambient sense of belonging that that cis men have and that white men have, and white cis men especially this this ambient sense of belonging. And for me, as a trans person, I can't I can't help you know almost wanting to leap at every cis man who goes like, all right, what what are you so angry about? <laughs> and it just be able to say like, I want the ambient sense of belonging where I would have seen myself throughout my life, including as a baby and as a child, and, and, that, and that culture would come from a non-binary narrative. And until that happens, and until it's overwhelming, I feel like I'm always just going to be pissed and hopeless. And furthermore, I want that for everybody. I want everybody to share that feeling. And the people who have too much of it, I want them to relinquish a little bit of it. So, you know, there's a, there's a but, sense- Well, of, what's gonna make them? They don't even hear that they have it. Like, how do you wake up people who can't see the, can't see the ambient sense of belonging, who still wanna be in the argument? And when we wanna say, listen, you, you wrote the argument, you wrote the questions, you wrote the answers, you wrote the history, step outside. My personal feeling is that those people who have managed to be in denial about reality or rewrite their own reality I feel will I find that cis men just still want to get to a place where they want to be right I I feel like climate change is the thing that is the reality check for human humanity I feel like that's the thing that is going to change that sort of narrative because it is an undeniable truth that people have to bend and flex to that people are going to have to organize things differently but you know again I'm a utopian at heart so I'm hoping that that will be something that will bring a better organization of society rather than a far worse one can I just jump in there for a second I'll I'll, I'll do one timekeeping thing which is to tell the audience that um, in about five minutes, we're going to transition towards your questions, and I'm going to moderate those because Joey can't see us um, uh, or that list. Um, but I would, I would love to hear you each draw out your vision of utopia a little further. Um, uh, Olivia, in the sense of hearing, what does the chorus 
sound like? And Joey, as a visual intellectual, what does it look like? And what are you doing to get us there? Just, um, uh, Olivia, I was so persuaded by your course correction that instead of doing the dystopian work, we should write the better future and see if anybody will join. So um, paint a few pictures for us. <laughs> this is actually the subject of my new book, which I'm working on right now. Um, Joey, you go first. Okay, great. Um, well, there's there's an amazing activist named Jenea Khan, and they speak about a way that penguins keep each other warm. They form a spiral, and the spiral is constantly moving. So the people on the, the penguins on the outside are moving into the center, then the, the the penguins on the center are moving into the outside, and everybody stays warm because everyone gets their time in the center. And I, I really, you know, whenever people say, well, you know, oppression Olympics, who goes first? You know, I always just say center the marginalized, center the marginalized, center the marginalized. And I think if cis people and if white people can want that to be their first, you know, as a white person, our first move um, before defending anything that came before, but to recognize that the marginalized need to be center, centered and need to set their own agenda. Again, you know, these things seem like simple ideas, but they're very hard to get out. It's very hard to get people to, to jump jump in on. They want they want to argue about well, then who's marginalized and who's first? Mm. Yeah, it does just come back to that me first <laughs> attitude that feels very deeply baked in. Um, my utopia at the moment is a planet with water, which feels like a thing that I hadn't even realised how precious it was until we headed into the first real sense of apocalyptic climate change in in the UK which I know everybody else has already experienced far in advance of us but we're really seeing it here now and that that sense of you know this land that was green feels to me like the most important thing to to be able to um to be able to regard ourselves as not the most important species is my utopia currently can you tell us a little bit more about the new project as well yeah, sure. It's um, it's a journey really from the 16th century. Well, no, actually, I mean, it starts in the Garden of Eden. It's about Eden. It's about Edens that have been attempted in the past. It's about failed utopias, the ideas that might be usable from them and possible utopias. So it's got all kinds of revolutionaries and breakaway sects and queer garden utopias. And it is after writing everybody a very pleasant book to write because it's full of you know, all of these joyous ideas and all of these experiments that are filled with potential it's a it's a seed bank of a book potential but also failure some haven't worked yet seed bank is the way that i'm looking at them <laughs> i want to tack over to a couple of audience questions and joey keep jumping in and out um uh i can't ping you because i can only see your phone square um to take us from from hope in a darker direction we have several audience questions about fear with which you started uh olivia can we talk about this terror of the free body of fluidity of unboundedness why is our deep terror about these things uh resident in ourselves what are have you have you theorized that fear through doing this work um, and thinking about how to get past it. And uh, and Joey, I'd love to hear from you about that too, if there's time. Yeah, sure. So, th I mean, this really, we haven't talked much about psychoanalysis, but Wright was, Wright was Freud's best pupil and they fell out. And this is really, I think, at the core of why they fell out. Freud believed man is wolf to man. Freud believed that at root, we are these violent creatures and that we need civilization like a prison camp to hold us in position and to make us stop tearing each other apart to make everything stop being a world of rape and murder and Reich thought that was insane and thought we were innocent good beings and that what deformed us what made us behave like that was patriarchal capitalism so you know you've got these two really different ideas and that's why I wanted to end the book with this sense of what would it be like to be inside a body that didn't feel fear for a moment? Freud believes that there is no possibility of that body. 
but we all know that some of us experience more fear than others because some of us have more things to be afraid of. So imagine those structures were removed. Imagine that we could live inside a body that didn't experience misogyny, that didn't experience racism, that didn't experience transphobia or homophobia. What would that be like? What kind of world, what could you do with the time that is wasted being afraid of these things? And I'm not saying we shouldn't be afraid of these things, they're real things. I mean, what if they didn't exist? What if we didn't have to be afraid of them because they weren't there? So that sense of how we hold terrors in our body and what that energy could be used for, I think that's a really essential Reikian question. And that was something, maybe almost the most important thing for me about his ideas was to think about what we are holding inside our bodies and why we are holding it. And his argument really is the only way you can get rid of those things is to change the structures we live inside. Freud thinks the structures are absolutely necessary. Right thinks we can change them. Got to say I'm with Reich on that. Joey, what do you think? Yeah, I I, I do these like thought exercises, like thought exercises to keep myself from feeling fear. You know, when I imagine that we're in the sort of worst place in the world, I I just kind of start to imagine like all of all of the men who are my enemies, whether it's you know Trump or for somebody who's, you know, behaving like a misogynist. And I just really imagine that they're all going to be in jail in a couple of years. And that it's my job to figure out how well to feed them. And that I visit them and how kind do I want to be when the world has slipped away from them. I just pretend like, you know, there's a black, queer, trans woman in the White House in four years. I imagine it. I could never have imagined Trump, so this is nothing to imagine. A queer White House, a black White House, a trans White House, we have to imagine it. And yeah, my thought exercise is, you know, we're all at a party dancing and um, there's a prison underneath where they're all just, you know, begging for food. <laughs> you know, I, I put myself in, the, in that thought and then I can fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a binary. Um, I mean, I, I let let me let me press you both on that and ask about um, whether enemies is a useful category in this work, or whether there's a way to reimagine our political spectrum as you're thinking about the kinds of radi radical liberatory possibilities that um, that you're both working toward. I mean, I guess I, I much as I enjoyed that, I probably don't think in terms of enemies, I'm not a big one for, I don't really like the idea of projecting all evil onto an individual, even though a lot of individuals behave like they are already doing that. So <laughs> I love the idea that that's what Jeff thinks about to go to sleep. <laughs> I think saying that question of how, of how, of how, how kind would you be? If the tables were turned and if we had the power we imagine and if if you know what would it mean to rehabilitate reform i mean i used to just say like you know maybe it would be good if all the cis men went to the park and played hacky sack for a year and gave everybody else a chance you know doesn't have to be prison but um i just really think an abdication of patriarchal privilege and and the way that it it makes power, I think is really important for, for people to start to recognize. I think the hacky sack I just want to is a great to that. Yeah. <laughs> hacky sack probably better than prison. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do the hacky sack. I think hacky sack prison is a good prison. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, <laughs> Joey, your your first vision has a little bit of the Christian hell about it. And we could, we could talk a lot about where that comes from. Um, uh, I want to ask an, uh, an audience question here um, that, that carries Joey's core here about yielding power and asks Olivia to talk more about the decentering of species power, of human power um, in a future utopia, what that looks like, uh, how we decenter humans and why you consider that a key. Oh, I don't know how we do it, but we ha we absolutely have to do it. There's no question. This this sense that we have um, used up everything regarding it as a resource, only to realise at the very last minute that actually it was an incredibly interconnected, complicated, and fragile but robust ecosystem on which we depend. The idea that we're going to get rid of insects and then be like, oh shit, now we don't have any food. 
seems like the dumbest way for a species to die and it will be the way we die unless we change our thinking about it so that ability two things the ability to think interconnectedly to see how we're connected to think in terms of networks and the other thing which i think humans find so difficult which is to be able to see the consequences of an action we turn on a tap and there's water but we cannot get our heads around the idea that as we're doing that it's coming out of a river somewhere else the sense that we put the washing machine on and that's having a consequence we take a flight that's having a consequence because they're in invisible because they happen in different country in a different place in a different climate we cannot put those things together and i think this is where people like me and joey who tell stories this is our job our job is to make those connections visible that sense of showing how something done in one place washes up in another place is what the novel is for it's what the film is for it's what television is for that I think is what our work needs to be at this point in the 21st century is showing how that kind of thing happens and also how powerful we are. We also think that we're completely powerless and actually individual actions have huge power. We're seeing that everywhere, huge negative toxic power. We can flip that, that's possible. And, and that, um, that sense of connectedness interpersonally um, shines through this project very strongly, right? That of, of putting causes and effects and uh, personal stories that oscillate off each other um, uh, into the same room comes through powerfully in everybody. Um, we have an audience question, and I think we we'll probably have time for one more after this about artistic practice that I would love to extend to both of you. Um, how do you sustain your practices in the face of so much crisis and despair in the contemporary world? Um, how did you dig in rather than turning away, um, uh, think utopian instead of dystopian? Uh, the question is about writing first for Olivia, but um, we could certainly talk about uh, visual and musical and filmic narratives with Joey as well. That's a really good question. I mean, I, I often feel a lot of despair, but at the same time, I feel very driven to, I think especially with everybody, it was really like, there's an idea that we have to do it all alone, that we have to do the work of freedom alone, and that if it doesn't work right now, it's done. And what I wanted to tell is a story that was about the last century, really for young people. I really wrote this book for people in their 20s to be like, this is a transgenerational work. This is work that involves many people who you will never know. And it has always been one step forward, three steps back. It is always a push and pull against vast forces. You might secure a victory, but you can't sit back and go, that's done now, that work is finished. It's going to be ongoing. And I think when we realign to that and think, okay, this is gonna go on way past the time that I'm dead. I just have to contribute to this. I don't have to solve this. I just have to contribute. For me, that felt actually very liberating. It's sort of humbling. Your own role is lesser, but at the same time, the despair kind of diminishes because you just have to play a part. You're choosing all the time, and this is a binary, I believe, and you're choosing to further that work or you're choosing to block it. And who doesn't want to choose to further it? It's great. That's the work to do. So I guess that's how I feel better about despair is to just, I just need to show up and do my bit. Joey, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I have felt a lot of despair in terms of what I used to do, which is kind of, you know, write, you know, write memoir-ish things, a word doc, changing it from Times New Roman to Garamond, hoping I'll <laughs> like it. <laughs> I just uh, have not been able to get my fingers on the computer much. I, I've really been doing stuff that really takes me being in my body, documentary, you know, filming, um, working on theater with faith. The computer has become a place for me, you know, not of solace anymore where I can, where I can get those words out. There's just too much awfulness coming through. So I'm struggling. I'm struggling mm -hmm. with, with my first favorite thing, which is writing. Joey, can I ask, I, as a historian, I, I love the thread of time. Hello? You there? Oh, yeah. 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 I love the thread of time in Olivia's response um, and in the book as well, right? That thinking of yourself in time and in this 
branching tree of biographies and ideas. I think that's another remarkable quality to the book is um, uh, they're not heads in jars, they're biographies of people living imperfectly in bodies. So, so Olivia, I took a, a core of your answer that thinking in time helps you. Um, uh, is that something that you recur to, Joey, as well? It's, it's certainly in some of your work. Mm, I'd say it's in your work. Yeah, that, that's a sort of idea of the epigenetic and the, and the heroine's journey, that the heroine's journey moves in a spiral and, the, and that you're moving forward, but you're returning to the same place. Um, that's definitely helpful for me. Um, and, and also just existing in time. You know, I remember being a young person and reading Andrea, D Andrea Dworkin and, and having her affect me so much. Um, and then to, you know, come to this place in my life where now, I, you know, I know people who know her and, and Olivia made her so alive. And, and I feel like I, I can, you know, I can hear her and that I am still in conversation with Andrea and in relationship with Andrea and thinking uh, about her, even though, you know, we never, we never did meet. So I guess imagining that all these conversations and the, and these, these ways of being artists are, are connected through time. And that, that's what I loved was it did feel like a, a real spiral journey to, to be able to go from Nina Simone to Andrea Dworkin um, and to Bayard Rustin and, and, and to write. It, it, just, it just felt like you were kind of moving, moving in this way that held the reader and that you kept kind of coming around. It felt like a great, a great experience to me. Um, that I don't know. Honestly, your book has been a guiding light for me, Olivia. It's really helped me to kind of focus on on what it is I want to do. I'm so thrilled by that. I'm really, really pleased. And Joey, you you describe a feeling that I often have in the archive, right? Um, uh, a kind of uh, secular communion of souls who didn't get to speak or didn't get to fight uh, in life, but who. Um, uh, who do it in our boxes. I'm also smiling because there's somebody very close to Andrea um, on the call who I'm sure is enjoying uh, hearing your words too. Um, let me ask just a quick last audience question in closing. Um, if you can share with us, Olivia, and I'll, I'll ask you to take us out, um, something that you're reading or watching or listening to that really inspires you and lifts you up now in the way that your book uh, has lifted Joey up as they've described uh, in a very dark time. Um, what, are you, what are you looking at hearing, reading, um, thinking about that, um, uh, that gives a little green to your hills that are so brown right now? I'm, I'm changing the height of my computer because my computer was resting on it. So this has just been republished, it's Cookie Mueller Walking Through Clear Water in a Pool Painted Black, which I came up reading Cookie. She was one of John Waters um, film stars and she writes incredibly viscerally and beautifully about this very adventurous and wild life. And I, I wrote the introduction for it. So I, I was rereading them recently and thinking, God, I want every kid I know, everybody from, I don't know, 15 to 25 to be given a copy of that book and to just feel that the world is this place of adventure as well. I think we're in, you know, we're bombarded by all of these bleak stories, but that sense that you can just sort of wander out of your front door with very little and walk into all kinds of scenarios that might be joyful and explosive as well. I think that that feeling really needs to stay close to us. So I'm very glad it's it's very interesting timing that it's come out right now when there's such a sense of sort of fear and looking down and it's just open and expansive. So everybody get a copy, please. Well, thank you for leaving us with something to hold in our heart and uh, Olivia and Joey as well for hanging in through these technical difficulties and for an every body of work um, that gives us places to imagine a different future. Um, this will conclude our program for today. I wanna thank Olivia for their moving reading and conversation, Joey for their thoughtful moderation and perseverance um, and our audience for terrific questions. The discussion has been recorded and will be posted on the Radcliffe website in about a week. Um, and for information on upcoming Radcliffe virtual programs and videos of past events. Uh, you can see the website uh, that has been put in the chat for you. 
Um, thank you all so much for being with us this afternoon uh, and truly take good care. Bye.